Uh, Istanbul, and then I just had to pause and stop and try and figure out what to do. What I really wanted to do was use this brilliant excuse that I'd just been handed to give up the whole stupid idea and go home with my honour intact. Um, but I'd only been going for about six weeks, I thought oh, it's a bit early to, uh, to give up already. So the other option was to go over the top of the, uh, the, of the danger area, as it were, and uh, on down towards um, Australia that way. But I thought only an idiot's going to go through Russia in the winter time, so that ruled out that option. So all that was left then was to go south. So from Istanbul, instead of carrying straight on to Asia, I found myself turning right and heading for Africa instead. Excuse me. Uh, that was the score. And I uh, came through, through the Middle East into Africa, and there I was, stood at the pyramids, my panniers were peddling for about a year and a half, and then you <laughs> arrived in Prudhoe Bay, northern Alaska. From Alaska, I crossed the Atlant uh, Pacific on another boat over to Siberia. By now, I've been peddling for about three years, and cycling. No offence, cycling really doesn't require much brain power, so my brain had now shriveled to pea-sized proportions, so I now thought what a fun idea it would be to cycle through Siberia in the winter time. So I did that, and it was about as much fun as it sounds. And I came down to Japan, crossed over to China, and I followed the Great Wall of China west, right the way across China to Xinjiang province, to where the Great Wall finishes in the Taklamakan Desert. And I was a bit worried about the Taklamakan Desert because Taklamakan means he who goes in shall not come out. So I was a bit worried about that, but I made it out the other side and then a quick dash across Central Asia, across Europe and home again for a nice cup of tea. And when I started the whole thing, I thought it would take about three years to get around the world, but I quickly realized I wasn't nearly as speedy and heroic as I imagined I was. So in the end, it took me more than four years, but I just about limped home in the end. So this is me out on my bike, Beryl. She's the, the love of my life for the past four years. And it probably looks like it's a big, heavy bike. And it was big and it was heavy and riding this up mountains was hard work or pulling it through desert or pushing it through um, snow drifts. It was big and it was heavy. But another way to look at this is nice and easy through Istanbul, through the Middle East and into Africa. Now this is a rubbish picture. Um, and um, but it's an important picture, it's my bike out the cliffs of Dover and this was my final view of England for, for four years. Um, before I began the trip, my head was filled with all the thoughts and all the great exciting things about travel and the places you go and the adventures and all the fun stuff about travelling. I hadn't really given much serious thought, I realised, to some of the other sides of this which was that for four years I wasn't going to see my friends I wasn't going to see my family, I was going to be a stranger everywhere I went and on top of that I had a heck of a lot of cycling to do and the whole thing was going to be pretty hard work. So I was feeling pretty sorry for myself when I set off. My, my girlfriend I'd been with for years, for some reason she didn't think that uh, cycling for four years and sleeping in ditches and eating bananas, that didn't sound much fun to her. So sadly we split up and I'm it's probably like the biggest Roman temples in the world, I'm completely deserted, I had the place to myself, terrible for them. Brilliant for me, I could put my tent up here and have an amazing campsite. And at the same place in Baalbek is this, which is the biggest brick in the world. 2,000 years ago, the Romans wanted to build the biggest temple ever seen um, to, to worship their gods. And they were going to use bricks this big. And to show you how big this brick is, that's my bike there. So just imagine how big this temple would have been. If the bricks probably well, it's a bit small in this room, but it's significantly enormous brick. Imagine how imp impressive this would have been if they'd succeeded. Unfortunately, they only made one brick before some, <laughs> some boring person with some common sense came along and said, guys, why don't you use normal sized bricks? So, um, but I admired their ambition, and you never know unless you know how that was Sudan. The biggest country in Africa, been having a civil war for 40 of the last 50 years. But what I was personally worried about in Sudan was that from the Egyptian border, Wadi Halfa, to the capital, Khartoum, there's no road at all, it's just a desert. I'd never really been to a desert before, I'd certainly never been across one on a bike, I, I just didn't know, I was pretty naive and raw and callow and just not really hardened to some of the realities of the world. And uh, physically it's pretty hard, you know, massive mountains, rubbish roads, hot, weird food, usual kind of stuff. But what I found really hard there was just mentally and emotionally a beautiful city at the end of South America. And it took me nine months to get through South America. But when I was here, Ushuaia, um, 
trying to get out of bed, get on the bike, I found so, so difficult. Everything I'd done up till now was irrelevant, really. I was right back to a brand new, my all-time greatest Leeds United teams you can think about before you get a bit bored with that. So I was always trying to have ways to amuse myself. So one thing I did here was I pulled my woolly hat down over my eyes so I couldn't see a thing, and I pedaled for half an hour. Because where in the world can you do that without banging into something? Brilliant. But when I looked up, I was going off in totally the wrong direction. And the other thing I did here, this is quite a, it's quite a popular place with backpackers and tourists for obvious reasons. And you can see it. From here, I jumped on a little boat to take me through uh, the Panama Canal and on up towards North America. And uh, I was really looking forward to going to North America. I'd never been to uh, America, the US before. Um, so I was looking forward to that. This is the route I took. I came up the west coast, so through California, Oregon, Washington. And this west coast is shaped through Siberia. It's because that's the only road in an area the size of Europe. There was one road, it was just a gravel track. So that gives you an idea of how empty it was up there. Uh, then down Japan, across China, quick dash through Central Asia, and home again at last. Uh, Russia, Russia was probably one of the hardest um, three months of the whole trip. Um, the history of Russia, I felt it almost like a physical presence of pushing down me. Um, I, I didn't really know very much about uh, Soviet history before I got there. Just the, the, the area was just so sad, the millions and millions of people who died in the prison camps there. The road I was riding is called the Road of Bones, because they say a prisoner died for every metre of progress on this road. And when they died, they were simply just ploughed into the road and work was carried on. It's just such a brutal... Hard. The best way I can describe minus 40 to you, when you go home tonight, empty out all the food from your freezer. And if you've got a really big freezer, if you've got a really, really good freezer, the temperature in there is about minus 20. So go home and sleep in your freezer. It'll be a luxury hotel compared to camping at minus 40 with a big hole in your tent. It was Siberia to Japan was probably the, the, well, the biggest culture shock of my whole journey. And Japan was a country that I'd never had any interest in at all. I'd never had any desire to go there at all, which I think is probably a really good reason to go somewhere. So I, uh, the, but the only real reason I went to Japan was because it happened to be next door to Russia. So I wasn't really thinking much about it, except it's great to be out of Russia. Um, but I absolutely loved Japan, and I ended up staying every single day of my three-month visa right to the end, um, just because it was so different to here. It's, but it's, I just found. It's such a different and interesting place, and it, the people were so amazingly polite and friendly. It was so safe. You could sleep in railway stations, you could sleep in the uh, town parks. I felt really safe everywhere. And then uh, finally, on top of all of the sort of different and interesting things, I just found the place hilarious. Every day, there was just something that was just normal for them, but totally poor place, really poor. And I ate my noodles, paid my money, and I was just leaving when this little boy came out of the back room, this big bowl of hot water, really slowly over to me, put it down, then his mum came out of the back room with a uh, bottle of shampoo, and she made me wash my hair. <laughs> I washed my hair, and then she got her husband's comb, so I combed my hair and set off across China, smelling like a summer meadow, eat my super noodles in peace, and read my book. Um, so another great, another thing of Central Asia was that it's the, it's the land of the Silk, Ro Silk Road, and the Silk Road is now it's a bit of a cliche, but just to be able to sleeping out somewhere like this, it's really hot, you don't need your tent, sleeping out under the stars, knowing that for hundreds of years people have been moving backwards and forwards in this area on their own journeys from Asia to Europe and back for hundreds and hundreds of years, I really, I, I just love the fact that I was sleeping out there looking at the stars just as people have been doing for hundreds of years, and. Um, and it was, I was so fit. I'd just ride for eight hours a day, going whizzing up these mountains, singing at the top of my voice. And I was so excited. I was nearly home after all this time. I was really looking forward to getting home. But also, I was really, really sad that all of this was nearly over. The best four years of my life. I knew I'd never do something like this again. I knew how lucky I'd been to have.